Hello, today we'll be talking about FAPE, a nonlinear dimensionality reduction method that is specialized for visualization developed by our lab. The motivation for developing FAPE was that a lot of the existing methods people were using to visualize data, particularly biomedical data, failed to capture global structure or any structure in the data. Sometimes, even if the global structure was somewhat captured, the methods were unable to denoise the vast degree of noise that was prevalent in biomedical data. As a representative example, here is an artificial tree-like data set. Now, tree-like data sets are uncommon in the biological sciences, whether it's because of phylogenetic trees or because of differentiation structure in cellular populations that are now being measured by single cell RNA sequencing. So we drew this very artificial tree and then sampled along this tree with some noise and rotated this into high dimensions. Now we can test what different dimensionality reduction methods do with this. So you see what PCA does. PCA gives you an embedding as if you're a person standing over here and these are all the walls. Gives you a projection onto a plane that's around there where the blue and the purple are overlapping each other as are the dark green and the light green. Um, yet we do see some of the large amount of variance in the data in this axis. TSNE on the other hand, which is another popular dimensionality reduction method, focuses on keeping near neighbors together. So whenever we happen to have areas of sparsity because of sampling artifacts, we see that TSNE feels free to shatter the data because its penalty is in encouraging it to keep the data manifold together. By contrast, FAPE is a visualization method that we designed explicitly to denoise this noise back down to these thin lines and keep the global structure, particularly the manifold structure, of the data. How does FATE actually work? Now that you've seen how diffusion maps work, it's not going to be extremely difficult for you to understand how FATE works. In fact, the first four steps are the same as that of diffusion maps. First, we have data. Here, we've showed the data as the observations being cells and the features being genes in order to motivate it, particularly in the biomedical sciences. Then we convert the, those to Euclidean distances. Then we convert them to affinities. We usually actually use a kernel called an alpha decay kernel, which is like the Gaussian kernel, but power to a higher degree alpha. Then we Markov normalize this affinity matrix, and now we have a diffusion operator where the rows contain diffusion probabilities from one data point to all other data points. Here is where fate really differs from diffusion maps. We do not eigen decompose this diffusion operator. That, was, that would give us a diffusion map. And in fact, fate is not a variant of kernel PCA. It does not eigen decompose anything at all. Instead, we take these new diffusion probabilities as a representation of each data point, and we see that data points can be assigned, or pairs of data points can be assigned a new distance based on these diffusion probabilities. This new diffusion probability-based distance has a log damping factor so that small probabilities corresponding to points that are far from a given point actually impact the distance in a greater way than they would if we didn't do this log scaling. This new distance gives you a symmetric distance matrix, which we then embed with MDS. We usually use metric MDS to preserve these new distances. So we started out with some kind of original Euclidean distances, but we did not embed those because then we would get classic MDS, which is not good at visualization actually. Instead, we worked hard to learn the data manifold, and we learned 
a different version of manifold distances, which are then preserved with MDS. As to review the steps and their value, we still retain the value of the steps in a diffusion map in as far as computing the diffusion operator. First, we do have this distance matrix that takes away all the feature dimensions and give you, gives you pairwise distances. Then we have an affinity matrix that inverts the distances, makes these sideband sort of fade and localizes the connections, but still does not totally clean them. Then we have a T-step powering of the diffusion operator. Fate makes a very specific recommendation for what this T should be. It says that it should be equal to this factorial entropy of the diffusion operator. In other words, it should have as many dimensions, more or less, as the diffusion operator displays. Once we do that, Fate uses these diffusion probabilities from this powered Markov matrix as a new representation of a cell. Um, here, each data point is a cell, <coughs> and it's represented or contextualized by all the other data points in your data set. So you get an idea of what's close to this data point or what's far away from this data point. This kind of global contextualization is also a feature, actually, of word vector embeddings particularly the method GLOVE. Um, once we have these probabilities, um, we have a probability distribution representing each data point. When there is a probability distribution at each data point, this can be called as a statistical manifold. In this sense, it does not make sense to take, in this context, it does not make sense to take Euclidean distances. The Euclidean distances would emphasize the near neighbors and perhaps lose the global structure of the data. Instead, we try to equalize the impact of near and far distances using a log damping factor. But we show that other divergences, particularly if they're symmetricized, would also work here. A particular divergence we pick is an M divergence. And it's also the square root of a norm. It's a metric. And this new metric we preserve using MDS, and we squeeze all the variability into two to three dimensions. Now, if you're wondering what exactly is the relationship between diffusion maps and fate, it's illustrated in this figure. This is a different branching trajectory that we've embedded with fate. If you look at the diffusion components, diffusion component one, the first non-trivial diffusion component, is actually zero for most of this data and is active, is taking on non-zero values along this trajectory. So it's really encoding this trajectory. The second non-trivial eigenvector, which is the diffusion map's second component, is, is picking out this trajectory. So what the diffusion map is doing is it's basically putting each trajectory into a different eigendimension. Therefore, it's sort of disentangling or decomposing the data into different clusters, branches, paths, or whatever you would want to call them. Whereas fate is trying to collect them all into two dimensions. So you can see the relationship of these branches to each other. And so actually fate and diffusion maps play very complementary roles with each other. And you can color fate with a diffusion map to gain a lot more information or extract progressions in the data. So in the paper, we also demonstrate fate on this data set. This data set contains human embryonic stem cells. They're allowed to grow as these spheres that are called embryoid body bodies. These are allowed to differentiate for 27 days. And some proportion of the cells were harvested after 3, 9, 15, 21, and 27 days, respectively. When we harvested these cells and single cell RNA sequenced them, they were at different phases of differentiation. We did not provide this information to any of these embeddings. We just embedded the data 
that just came in a matrix by combining all these samples. This is what we get. Um, and it's particularly clear to see what we get when we superimpose the sample harvesting times onto these plots. PCA gives us the global structure of this data. It starts from these human embryonic stem cells, which are undifferentiated at day zero and three. And it slowly progresses forward with the shape widening, representing divergent lineages that are emerging as a result of this differentiation. TSNI, on the other hand, shatters, probably in an area of sparsity, and scrambles the global structure. Diffusion maps are primarily storing this trajectory in diffusion component one, and this spread for these pads in diffusion component two. So you'd have to take a look at a lot more diffusion components to try to understand what's happening in each trajectory. But you may not understand how the trajectories are connected with one another. By contract, contrast, fate reduces the noise in this data set and gives you cleaner branching trajectory structure. And that's really what fate is sort of designed to do. If you want to think about data that has more of cluster structure, this is a data set of retinal bipolar cells that have three main clusters. But you see fate looks inside of clusters and tries to find progressions and sub-progressions within each of these separations. And in fact, recently we have an extension called multi-scale fate that'll zoom in to reveal more and more structure. One of the advantages to using a visualization method in particular over any nonlinear dimensionality reduction method is that the visualization method can inform you about the entire structure of the data, which can tell you how many clusters you want to cluster it to or any other kinds of analyses that you might do. And this can be very useful in many different data contexts. Here's a thousand genomes data set where human genomes are sequenced with respect to SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. When this data is dimensionality reduced, you see divergent population structure in fate, but not a clear picture of what is happening to the entire data in some of the other methods. And this is really the reason why you would want to design a method specifically that keeps global structure in low dimensions.